Hey, thanks for joining me today for episode 15 of Business in the Bedroom, a bootstrapper's guide to doing it. I'm your host, producer Jemmy, providing practical advice for the newbie entrepreneur. And today I'm going to talk to you about what goes into a contract to CYA. Yep, once again, I'm talking about covering your ass. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Flintstone Media. Listen in and let's do this. All right. Well, once again, as a reminder, I got this idea from Whitney Daniel Co. on Clubhouse. She's at Whitney DC underscore on Clubhouse. And I actually just came out of another one of her rooms talking about Black Girl Magic, essentially. And it was really, really fun. But I got this idea from her when I was preparing the last episode because I was in another one of her rooms and I mentioned that I was putting together an episode about getting that shit in writing. And so she's like, well, can you also talk about really what should be included, especially in terms of what happens if you break a contract and that kind of stuff. So I thought that should be really its own episode. So here we are now recording that for Whitney and all of you who want to hear about it. Now, again, here's my caveat. I am not a lawyer. I repeat, (laughs) I am not a lawyer. I just went to law school and have lawyers in the family, but I myself am not a lawyer. But take my advice for what it's worth. I'm just going to tell you what has worked for me. So let's dive right in. And I'm actually going to be super linear and break down my own contracts from top to bottom. So what goes on top? Yep. What? Not who? This is not that kind of show. Just remind you, it's called Business in the Bedroom, but it's still not that kind of show. So what goes on the top of the contract? At least this is what I like, right? Please consult your own lawyer. So I like to add in the legal name, the tax ID, and the mailing address of both my business and the business entity I'm contracting with. Right then and there, top, front and center at the top of the contract. If it's an individual, then instead of the business name, I put their legal name, social security number instead of their tax ID, and then their address, their mailing address, what have you. And I've also asked them for their contact info so I can include that in the contract. So that's going to be their email address and their phone number. So I put all of that right in the contract for a couple of reasons at the top, just clarity, super easy to see. For anybody who might need to know who's involved in this contract, any immediate terms, anything like that, I can just pull it up and see right then and there. So then I include a brief statement of intent. So for example, my talent agreement for Florida Podcast Network's intent statement says, the purpose of this agreement is for the contractor to contract with Flintstone Media for the position of a host to perform any podcast-related production services for the roles, duties, and responsibilities referenced below, and to indemnify both Flintstone Media and its affiliates with respect to any actions taken by contractor and work performed by contractor outside the scope of this contract. Blah, 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 (laughs) right? But that's what's at the top to make it, again, I just try to put the stuff that's super, like the basic stuff of the contract right then and there. This is what it is, is who's involved and here's what we're intending to do. And then right underneath that, I add the term start and end dates, also super clear. So the parameters for ending the contract are also there. You know, how many days notice are required to be given, 30 days, 60 days, whatever, any penalties financial penalties, fines for, you know, ending a contract early, that kind of thing. Does it auto renew? If so, for how long? When does that kick in? How do you stop it? Blah, blah, blah. Then next, once you're done with all this top main stuff in the contract, next is the meat of the contract in terms of what is particular to the project that that contract represents? What is the agreement that that contract really represents? What is it about? And that's everything that was included in your proposal and or scope of work. So we spoke a lot in both the last episode, getting that shit in writing, and episode 10, pricing yourself about proposals and scopes of work. So just like your proposal and scope of work allow you to set boundaries and guardrails and avoid getting caught in situations where you're stuck doing tons more work than you ever anticipated, so is the contract. That is exactly what you're doing by putting a contract together. So it's super important. 
On Patreon, I had shared nine steps to write a scope of work for any project and industry and some free scope of work templates. So if you haven't seen those yet, be sure you go check them out on Dreamers Become Doers on Patreon. But between the proposal and the scope of work, you really should have all the key expectations laid out, essentially the performance of services and corresponding financial considerations of the project. So that is what you need to put in next. What are the project's deliverables? What's the agreed pricing? What's the pay schedule? All of that needs to be in there. And it should really lay out crystal clear what each party's responsibilities are and who owns what rights to the resulting work. So when that first part about what each party's responsibilities are, I mean, I I really lay it out super clear, crystal clear. I don't put big, wordy, huge paragraphs in my contracts. It's bullet points. Like, you're responsible for this and this and this and this and this. And I'm responsible for this, 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 and this. And that's what I have. So it's very very clear who is responsible for what. And then also when it, in terms of who owns the rights to that work. And you want to make sure it's, it's clear who owns the rights, so copyrights or whatever, but then also the licensing, so the rights to then use the work. So who owns it and then who has the rights to use it and what are those rights to use it, repackage it, those kinds of things. How long do those rights last for? So all of that kind of stuff needs to be really crystal clear and laid out in the contract. And it also needs to say in this part how payments can be rendered. So are you accepting payments by check, payments by credit card, you know, making sure that the other party knows that they're responsible for providing any information that you need to get them the money that you owe them or for them to get the money that they owe you, what have you. So all of that just needs to be really, really, really laid out in your contract. So again, at the top, it's all about kind of the basics of the who and the when and and a li- little touch on on the what with the intent, but then this meaty part is really all the what. Really what is the what of this project, right? What's in this contract? And then there's always got to be a section that is like typical what we call boilerplate stuff. It's all the stuff that really should be in just about every contract that you put together for your business. And this is going to fluctuate a bit depending on on what business that you're doing and stuff, but you should have a good lawyer who can build you a contract with just some good boilerplate stuff. So some of that stuff is going to include like all that NDA stuff that we talked about on the last episode. So non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality statements, those things that really protect the integrity of your information and the security of your data. So making sure that that's crystal clear, that they're not allowed to run around and start talking and telling everybody your business secrets, that should be in there, okay? And also it should be in there, what are the repercussions, as Whitney had asked and pointed out, what are the repercussions when parts of the contract aren't fulfilled? What causes the contract to become null and void? What are the penalties and what would trigger those penalties? And how, if those penalties are financial, how are they calculated so that everything is really indisputable, right? The point of it, of the contract is so that If at the end of the day, things go south and you end up in a court of law that a judge can look at a contract and very clearly understand what those responsibilities were and who broke those responsibilities and where the breach of contract lies and how that is divvied out in a court of law. Okay, so that is what a contract does. It's really like your Bible of what you have agreed to with that other person. So that, of course, needs to also include the repercussions. And part of that is the jurisdiction of where any corporate proceedings would happen. Where would it take place? So as an example, all of my contracts spell out that the jurisdiction, no matter where you are, (laughs) the jurisdiction is going to be Palm Beach County, Florida, okay? So I don't care where you are. But we're going to be adjudicating anything and everything if it comes to that in Palm Beach County, Florida. Then also what kind of process that you can use. So for example... A contract may require first that the disputes be handled in arbitration or mediation rather than directly heading into the court system. So 
that needs to be spelled out too. And as a side note of general life, you also want to make sure that you're reading any contracts that you sign and that you understand if there's a clause like this in particular in it, you know, with credit cards, with mortgages, with whatever you're signing, you want to know if anything goes wrong, if you're going to get screwed by a company, how and what are your options for recourse? So just side note on general life, anytime you sign something, buy a car, whatever, how can you get recourse if something goes wrong? So you just want to make sure you look at that clause yourself, anything you sign, and then also make sure you include it in every of the contracts that you put out for your business. And of course, you need a place to sign on the dotted line. So at the end of the contract, you need a signature spot. So a a line for their signature, a line for their printed name, a line for their position at the company, the name of the company too, if you want to put that there. And also a line that represents the date of the signing of the contract. So you want lines like that and you want for both yourself and a space for the other party. How I usually do it is I have them sign and then I'll sign the contract and then I'll send them back a fully executed version. That's how I usually do it. But to each his own, that's just what I do. Now, you've heard me talk ad nauseum (laughs) about the joy that comes to your future self by your past self using templates. So I won't bore you as my brother says, you talk about templates. Templates, I have templates. <laughs> I get it. Templates. I get it, Jemmy. You should be using templates. <laughs> so I won't bore you with all that here again, other than to say that everything I have said in the past about templates applies to contracts as well. But your lawyer should be able to provide you with a version of the contract you need that allows you to fill in the blanks, right? So whether he or she highlights those areas that need to be filled in, they should be able to basically give you a contract that represents your basic service offering for your company. And that's a template. So then you just have to cut and paste and fill in all the information for the person or business it applies to in that particular instance. But more to the point of looking professional in every moment, even if you are running your business from your bedroom, take that extra minute when you get the contract back from your lawyer and add your business's logo into the header of that contract. It's going to look so much more professional if you do that. That's just my opinion, but I think it's the right one. (laughs) So what I do is I have a document in my Google Docs cloud system that essentially is just a blank document with my logo in the header of it. So I don't have to do this every single time. So instead of recreating the wheel, I mean, this isn't a big wheel to recreate. It's just a document with my logo, but instead of having to do that over and over again, I have this document. So I just make a quick copy of it and then copy and paste the content from the contract that the lawyer sent over into that document. And now I have a completed, beautiful contract, templated and branded with my logo and styling and whatever. So then all you have to do really is just create a copy of that contract. Now that it has your logo and styling and everything and paste in all the particulars for the other person, their name, their address, everything. So you now have a templated general contract for the services of your company. And all you have to do is put in the name of whomever it applies to in that particular instance. Super easy. Trust me. Again, your future self will thank you. Then you'll want to be sure that you export your contract as a PDF. I always and only send contracts as PDFs in part because it is much more difficult to change anything on a PDF than it is if you send something over as like a Word document, for example. So don't do that. Send it over as a PDF for signature. I recommend using an electronic signature service. So please don't expect people to print a contract out, to sign it, and to scan it back in you can inadvertently create a burden on that potential client or partner, whomever, to find a way to print it and scan it back into electronic form for you. 
D- don't 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 do that. Don't put up any obstacles, especially right before they sign. Like don't do that. Instead, use an electronic signature service. There are a ton out there. I'd love to hear actually what you use and what you think of it. So please email me, Jemmy at flintstonemedia.com. I'm always open to exploring new tools if someone else has found value and a really great tool out there. I personally right now use small PDF. It's really cheap, (laughs) really, really cheap. And it's very simple as far as the interface goes. And it has a ton of great tools for PDFs. But the downside is that it, it can be a little bit clunky, to be honest. So up until a few months ago, you couldn't even cancel a signature request, for example, if you sent one out. And then maybe there needed to be an update to the contract, something they wanted to have changed. And then you wanted to reissue it and send them a new version of the contract. You you couldn't cancel the old signature request. And because of something else that small PDF does, it automatically generates reminder notifications every once in a while for that person. So you can't cancel the old request. So what it would do, the recipient would still get notifications to sign the old one because you couldn't cancel it. (laughs) So since then, they have added in a feature where you can cancel a signature request. You still can't stop the automatic reminders, but they do stop once you cancel a signature request. So at least that's made it better. So that's a big improvement that small PDF made. Thank the Lord. But it still does have its kinks. So you know, at least you can completely cancel a signature request. So that's a really good improvement. But anyways, yeah, I I love small PDF for what it's worth and certainly for the price, but explore other options. There are many out there and send me what you're using. I really love to know. So in closing, I just want to remind you once again, in case you forgot, I'm not a lawyer. I am not a lawyer, okay? This is just a guide to make sure that everything that you should have in your contract, you at least have a good checklist to, to, to communicate with your lawyer on. But yeah, I'm not one. But and, and there's so much more that needs to go into your contracts depending on what you need them for. So your lawyer can help you out with all of that. And then take what they send and apply it to your template doc with your styling and your logo and make it look really nice and professional. And I want to introduce you actually to my lawyer since, you know, I might as well because he has made all of my contracts and done an amazing job. And I purposely did not (laughs) ask him for his opinion on my content for this episode today so that in case I'm totally full of crap, he's not liable. Yay. And especially because he's my brother. So... (laughs) You're welcome, Gerard, for me not asking you your opinion on all the stuff I just said. But I am going to tell you, listening, to reach out to him. He is brilliant beyond brilliant, and he's going to be super embarrassed when I'm saying this. I don't care. He went to Harvard. He went to Columbia Law. He's like the smartest person on the planet. He's a brilliant contract lawyer. And so if you ever need contract services, reach out to Gerard Lagagne of GL Esquire Consulting. He's located in Miami, but he can help you out wherever you are. And I'll include a link to him in the show notes. And you can also email him, Gerard at G-L-E-S-Q, stands for Esquire, consulting.com. Or catch his podcast. Guess what, guys? He's actually the newest host on FPN. And guess what? As I mentioned in the last episode, I got him to sign that shit, right? He signed a contract when I hired him as talent. So he's now a host on FPN on a show called The Fresh Mix Podcast. And he will be joining me on Clubhouse soon in one of my Dreamers Become Doers rooms to discuss contracts further and answer your questions. So be sure that you are on Clubhouse and join the Dreamers Become Doers Club or look me up and follow me at Producer Jemmy, spelled J-A-I-M-E. I have my room dates and times and info listed right in my bio. And I'm also included links in the show notes to this episode to the club and to my bio to make it super easy. But in my rooms, our conversations really take a deeper dive into the specifics of everyone's goals in that room. And that can be yours too. So like this morning, I ran a room that resulted in a really great connection between two of the dreamers in that room. One, Carrie, shout out to Carrie. Hi, Carrie, is wanting to open a dog-friendly whiskey and cigar bar. I'll just leave her idea at that 
because it's amazing. It's so much bigger than that and so cool, but I'll just leave it at that so nobody steals it. <laughs> But then another woman in the room, C, she runs a pet rescue delivery service. Hi, C. And oh, hi, C. That's kind of funny to say. Hi, C. <laughs> so she is really well connected with people who can lend really strong insights for Carrie on how to put a business that involves dogs and pets and stuff, how to put a business like that together. And it totally fed my soul watching that connection happen in real time. This is why I do what I do. Carrie was really struggling this week, feeling stuck in her nine to five. And after being in that room this morning and connecting with me and connecting with C, we all left that room super motivated. And Carrie has amazing ideas now drawn up from this group and great connections to follow up on. So what was just a seedling of an idea now actually has some legs under it. And that happened because she came into my Dreamers Become Doers room on Clubhouse. I'm so excited. And C had an amazing idea that she is pursuing herself for a documentary. And both Carrie and C are going to be doing their due diligence as they branch out into their new business ideas by getting all that shit in writing. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you will also start following me on Clubhouse like Carrie and C. Remember, I'm at Producer Jemmy, spelled J-A-I-M-E. And just like you're going to look up Dreamers Become Doers on Facebook and on Patreon for all the really other good stuff, you will also look up Dreamers Become Doers on Clubhouse because that's where we get to have fun and supportive conversations in real time and is part of our real lives every week, every single week. But Clubhouse is invite only. So if you're not on there yet, but you're an Apple user, or if by the time you're hearing this, they've opened it up to Android users too, which would be awesome, then email me for an invitation. I have some to spare and I will get one over to you right away. So I want to hear from you for that. I want to hear from you for what e-signature service you're using. I want you to reach out and ask questions about the business you're building from your bedroom all the things. So email me at jemmy at flintstonemedia.com. Again, spell J-A-I-M-E at flintstonemedia.com. Or follow me on social media at Flintstone Media and DM me. And if you have anything to add here or to argue with me about, or you just want to ask a question and have your voice featured right here on the show, head to the show's website, bizinthebedroom.com. Hit the big red button and record your message. So again, that's B-I-Z in the bedroom.com. All right, that's it for today. Tune in next time as we take a deeper dive into another great topic about building your business from your bedroom. So remember to hit it hard, keep the lights on. 